Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled Rest in Christ. And strange it may seem, this particular lesson is entitled The Restless Prophet. It's lesson number 12 for, in that series for September 18 of 2021. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have come today to explore your word, to look at this very interesting character in the Old Testament, and to learn what we might learn about you from his activities and your response to him. May we be drawn nearer to you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the most interesting characters, I might add, in stories in the scripture has to be that of Jonah. Jim? Here he was, a prophet of God, someone called of God, and yet what? He ran away from God's call. Then, after being persuaded in a dramatic way to change his mind and obey the Lord, he did so then only to do what? To complain that the people to whom he was called to witness actually repented and were spared the destruction that otherwise would have been theirs. Adult Bible Study Guide for S September 11. There's a story, maybe it's apocryphal, I don't know, in which says, a former drug addict, now turned preacher, told him many disturbing statistics about drug abuse. He then pounded his Bible and said it was the only answer. Afterwards, a drug addict asked him if he really believed all those stories in the Bible. He said yes. Then he was asked if he believed in the story of Jonah and even, I mean of Noah and even Jonah. Again, he said yes. Then the questioner asked what he thought Jonah was thinking while in the belly of the whale, of the big fish. After thinking for a moment, the preacher replied that he, he would just have to ask Jonah when he got to heaven. What if Jonah doesn't go to heaven, asked the questioner. Then you can ask him, replied the preacher. Of course, a little humor there. But this is a story that I know is true. A teacher in Idaho asked a group of children what they learned from the story of Jonah. One child responded, even the fish learns that you can't keep a good man down. <laughs> So what do you think Jonah, what do you think of Jonah? His emotions seem to run high and then low through those incredible experiences recorded in his book. And what do you think about the words of Jesus himself referring to the story? Carrie? Reading from Matthew chapter 12, verse 41. On Judgment Day, the people of Nineveh, Nineveh, will stand up and accuse you because they turned from their sins when they heard Jonah preach. And I tell you that there is something here greater than Jonah. That's from the American Bible Society, 1992. So this week, what can we learn about Jonah and about his crazy experience of trying to run away from God? We must admit that Jonah was an amazingly successful missionary. He was also a very reluctant one. Why do you think that was? Jonah chapter 1 verse 1 through 17. One day the Lord spoke to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Tai. Mm -hmm. um, he said, go to Nineveh, that great city, and speak out against it. I'm aware that wicked its people are. Jonah, however, set out in the opposite direction in order to get away from the Lord. But the Lord sent a strong wind to the sea. No. He went to Joppa. Okay. He went to Joppa, where he found a ship about to go to Spain. He paid his fare and went aboard and the crew to sail to Spain, where he would be away from the Lord. But the Lord sent a strong wind on the sea, and the storm was so violent that the ship was in danger of breaking up. The sailors were terrified and cried out to, for help, each one to his own God. Then, in order to lessen the danger, they threw the cargo overboard. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone below, the, below and was lying 
the ship's hold sound asleep. The captain found him there and said to him, what are you doing asleep? Get up and pray to your God for help. Maybe he will feel sorry for us and spare our lives. The sailors said to one another, let us cast lots and find out who is, the, who is to blame getting us into the danger. They did so, and Jonah's name was drawn. Surely the Lord's hand was on this one. <laughs> <laughs> so they said to him, Now then, tell us, who is to blame for this? What are you doing here? What country do you come from? What is your nationality? Are you, are you suggesting that God has a hand in games of chance? <laughs> <laughs> like dice and <laughs> cards and <laughs> lots and roulette and like. Well, they, they cast lots and the name of Matthias came yes. up. And they That's chose how you. they chose someone to replace Judas in, among the twelve. I think they cast lots a bunch of times, didn't yes. they? Yeah. When did that practice? We don't even know how they did it. Some people have suggested that they put like a number of stones uh, colored stones yeah. with one a completely different color down in the jug and you had to reach in and pull one out. That right. would, and, and if you got the odd colored one, uh, that would be your, your lot, but we're not sure. Maybe we could suggest it to the policy makers of the church next time an issue comes up. Yeah. <laughs> women's ordination? Yeah, yes and no. Yeah. I mean, they were doing this. Yeah, in they the, were. Yeah. <laughs> there you are, but anyways. I'm a Hebrew, <laughs> Jonah answered. I worship the Lord. What a statement, huh? The God of heaven, who made land and sea. Going to the fourth commandment. Jonah went on to tell them that he was running away from the Lord. Yeah, oh boy. Now he knew better than that. But he's just got through saying he made the land and the and sea. sea. Yeah. But yet he thinks he can run away no, no, from the Lord. And he's telling them the lie. <laughs> <laughs> Something's wrong with Something is, That's right. The sellers were terrified and said to him, this was an awful thing to do. The storm was getting worse and all the time. So the sailors asked him, what should we do with you to you to stop the storm? Jonah answered, throw me onto the sea and it will calm down. I know it is my fault that you are caught in this violent storm. What a beautiful so who sermon. Who should we throw over when a hurricane comes by? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> a whole city, maybe. Isn't that, isn't that yeah. basically what, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's okay to go into this. I mean, uh, we know that the Lord's hands were in there. Is the Lord said, is, so is it the act of God that every time something like this happens? Or is it his arch enemy who is doing that? But the Lord was going to teach a lesson. How much he was able to teach Jonah, I do not know. But these guys, I, don't, I think they wanted to find out after this happened, who is this Jehovah of, yeah. of the Hebrews? I'll read on. He'll tell us. Instead, the sailors tried to get the ship to shore, rowing with all their might. But the storm was getting worse and worse, and they got nowhere. So they cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord, we pray, don't punish us with death for taking this man's life. You, O oh Lord, are responsible for all the th this thing, this. It is your doing. Now, that was a true witness, right? Yes. <laughs> then they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and it calmed down at once. This wow. made the sailors so afraid of the Lord that they offered a sacrifice and promised to serve him. I hope that was a serious promise. Yeah. <laughs> I, I always, when I read something like this, I always wonder, okay, when those sailors finally got home and talked to their wives, what did they say? That's like foxhole, those are in a foxhole, you know, yeah. are there any unbelievers in a foxhole? Yeah. 
What kind of a sacrifice did they offer? Yeah. And how? Yeah. Was the worship of their gods similar to the worship of Jonah's god? No. Well, I mean, the way they were worshiping him or the way well, he was supposed to be they, worshiped? Why would they think to do a sacrifice? Oh, there were many religions back in those days were offering sacrifices. So there were similarities in them. Some similarities, yeah. How do you know that uh, before Jonah was thrown out that he didn't give them a little bit more lessons? Oh, we don't know. Well, you know? that's possible. We don't know, but... Um, the sailors were pretty scared. <laughs> they sure were. But they saw his hands, you know, and they, I'm sure when they went home, they said, hey, is there any Jew around here? We want to know more of yeah. this Jehovah. So, who, who was responsible for the, for the storm? When Jesus and the disciples were on the lake, who brought the storm? Would Jesus bring the storm so he no. could talk to it? No. He permitted that to of happen. Of course. Did, uh, why not here? Yeah. What is our paradigm? Mm. Yeah. You know? Did the Lord cause it or did the Lord permit it? Permit it. Yeah. You know? That's, that's, a bit, that's a big question. Getting a lesson for all. Okay. Well, keep moving. And the Lord's command that fish swallowed Jonah. And he was inside the fish for three days and nights. Obviously, Jonah was not excited about the possibility of going to Nineveh, the capital, the big bully nation of his time. How did Jonah know that throwing him into the sea would stop the storm, as we just read? On what basis could he, be ma he make such a statement? Well, wasn't he a prophet? Did God actually send the storm against the ship that Jonah was in? as it seems to say in Jonah 1, 4. No, I got a quick question. Did he really, truly a prophet believe that he could run away from the Lord? Well, I, I'll tell you, just to say a little bit in his defense, it was believed by many people in those day, ancient days that there were different gods assigned to different territories. So if you were here, you have to worship this god, but if you go over there, it's a different god in charge. So that's probably what he thought. But Jonah is a prophet of the true God. I, he I, knows. I understand that. And he's he a Hebrew of all things. So. And, and, and none of us are influenced by th crazy thinking of other people? None of us would do that, would we? <laughs> okay. Or is it just a general understanding that whatever happens, God is behind it? When Jonah said he was a worshiper of Yahweh, the God of heaven, who made land and sea, did the sailors uh, think of the evil god of the sea, Mot, who always seemed to be angry? So what do we know about the people of Nineveh? Well, we know quite a bit about their kings. Asher Nasser Paul II, from 1883 to 1859 AD. Eight, 800, not 18. I'm sorry, 883 to 859 AD, boasted of dyeing the peaks of mountains red with the blood of his slaughtered enemies. He was known to flay his captives, possibly while they were still alive, and spread their skins on the walls of conquered cities. And this is actually B.C., isn't it? Yes. Right. I'm yeah, sorry. Typo there, right. Oh, yeah, this is B.C. Sorry, we got a typographical error there. Some people have claimed that, uh, although you can't absolutely prove this from the writings and the pictures and so forth, that they would beat people, just literally beat them until they're black and blue, and then skin them alive. Yeah. Can you imagine doing that? That's what the Nazis did here and there. Another atrocity cited by the Asher Nasser Paul, as well as by the, his successor, Shalmaneser II, was to have, and that was 1859 to 1824 B.C. Again, eight, no, eight, eight, 859. Not, 859 to 8424 BC, I'm sorry, was to have the heads of slain enemies' warriors cut off and stacked into a pile in front of a defeated city. Then the conquerors threw boys and girls from the city into bonfires. Hmm. Sennacherib, from 705 to 681 BC, who sent a force against Judah and Jerusalem in the time of Hezekiah, as we read in 2 Kings. 18 and 19, described cutting the throats of his enemies like lambs and cutting off their lives as one cuts a string. Apparently, he took grim pleasure in eviscerating his captives. 
Nineveh had a double wall, the inner portion of which was 100 feet high and 50 feet wide. That's from the Word in Life Study Bible. So, how did Jonah fit into all this craziness? Well, Jeroboam II began to rule in Israel around 792 B.C. Around 770 B.C., approximately the time of Jonah, as fit, that fitting it in with 2 Kings 14, 23 to 25, about 745, a Syrian emperor pushed westward under Tiglath, the Assyrian Empire pushed westward under Tiglath Pileser. 722 BC, Israel was taken captive by Assyria, and 612 BC, Nineveh falls to the Medes and Babylonians. That's a, just a very, very brief and outline of what's going on here. So approximately 50 years before Assyria captured Israel is when Jonah converted Assyria. Yes. Mm -hmm. The conversion worked for a for few years. While. Yeah. It is interesting to compare what we know about Jonah historically. Myra, I think that's yours. Second Kings fourteen twenty five. He, Jeroboam the second, conquered all the territory that had belonged to Israel from Hamath Pass in the north to the Dead Sea in the south. This was what the Lord, the God of Israel, had promised through his servant, the prophet Jonah, son of Amittai, you know, Amittai. Amittai from Gath Hefer. Apparently, Jonah had prophesied on behalf of God earlier in his experience. Some have even suggested that he worked for the king, Jeroboam II. And is that a possibility? Yeah, it is. The Assyrians, with their capital at Nineveh, worshipped Asher, the god of war. Guess what? Yeah. If one wanted to be really honored in Nineveh, she or he had to go out and conquer enemies. As we know, later, Assyria conquered and scattered the northern kingdom of Israel, and we have never heard... Uh, uh, we never heard about them again. The behavior of the Assyrians is well documented in his historical records. Gordon? So from the Adult Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sunday, in one inscription, Sennacherib claimed to have taken more than 200,000 prisoners from 46 fortified cities that he claimed to have destroyed. When the Assyrian king took Lachish, hundreds of thousands, hundreds or thousands of prisoners were impaled. Hardcore supporters of King Hezekiah were flayed alive, while the rest were sent to Assyria as cheap slave labor. And there's a picture of that in the museum, actually the- British Museum. In the British Museum in London, I've seen the actual, what is it? The there's wall a, yeah. deco decoration. Yeah. There's a huge long room with, with a, a part of the, what do they call that? Um, Bass relief, I think it is. Yeah, bass relief. That's bass right. relief from the Nineveh, from the some temple in Nineveh, and it has. I mean, you can see all that happening right there. Yeah. It's horrible. Yeah. Do you blame Jonah for want, for wanting to go in the other direction? <laughs> the most incredible part of the story of Jonah is his personal experience and the story of his flight, having traveled a short distance down to Joppa and. Booking a trip on a boat to Spain, he went down into the bottom of the boat and went to sleep. We know that a great storm came up. All the goods in the boat were thrown overboard trying to lighten the, the ship, but fear that the whole ship would be destroyed by the waves. Then they found Jonah asleep. According to the biblical record, God prepared a great fish which swallowed Jonah. It is impossible to know what kind of a creature that was, but... It is interesting to note that numerous stories from both ancient and modern times attest to the fact that a large fish or whale have swallowed humans and then spit them up again alive. And it's not mentioned in this lesson because these lessons were put together some time ago, but a man off the coast of Massachusetts was swallowed, partially swallowed by a, a whale just about three weeks ago. Yes, it was. There. And the whale spit him up. Yes. Of course, he was wearing, you know, breathing equipment and so forth, but... He was having I mean, trouble getting it out, and he finally did, but it had him really yeah. solidly. 
as well. He was them, alive. He's alive. Yes. He's alive. He got, oh, yeah. He got it was really dark down there. <laughs> <laughs> so was it head first then? It didn't really you know, say, didn't he, say. He, but it ha had him right with it, and he couldn't. He had trouble getting loose. Mm -hmm. And what kept him going, I guess, was a little bit of something from a bottle, but it, it pretty well chomped him down. Yeah. But if you look at some of those, I think here you'd call them grouper fish, they can grow pretty big. Yeah. And I've heard of uh, those. One of the most modern examples was reported in the Weekly World News of June 16, 1987, where the headlines read, Shark swallows fisherman, then spits him out alive. The lucky man was named, I don't know if I would consider him lucky, having been swallowed by a shark, but the lucky man was named Mikado Nakamura, and he gave an interview to the newspaper from the hospital bed in Kanazawa, Japan. And that's uh, quoted in the article on Joan in the Anchor Bible. Page 151. Jim? The only fish then capable of swallowing a man would be, large, would be a large specimen of the shark or the white shark, Caracas vulgaris, something like that, that dreaded enemy of sailors and the most voracious of the family of Squalidae. Squalidae. The shark which sometimes attains a length of 30 feet, is quite able to swallow a man whole. The whole body of a man in armor has been found in the stomach of a white shark, and Captain King, in his survey of Australia, said that he had caught one which would have swallowed a man with the greatest of ease. Blumenbach mentioned that the whole horse has been found in a shark, and Captain Basil Hall reports the taking of one in which, besides other things, he found the whole skin of a buffalo which a short time before had been thrown overboard from his ship. The white shark is not uncommon in the Mediterranean. Article on whales uh, by W. Smith of 1986 in Smith's Bible Dictionary. So this is something that can happen. I mean, we're just demonstrating, we're just documenting that. So what do you suppose Jonah thought when he first realized he had been swallowed? Well, he, we have a prayer recorded that he apparently recorded. We're not sure he was the one, but we're pretty sure he was the one who recorded it later. Carrie? Jonah 2, verses 1 through 9. From deep inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. In my distress, O Lord, I called you, and you answered me. From deep in the world of the dead I cried for help, and you heard me. You threw me down into the depths to the very bottom of the sea, where the waters were all around me, and all your mighty waves rolled over me. I thought I had been banished from your presence and would never see your holy temple again. The water came over me and choked me. The sea covered me completely, and seaweed was wrapped around my head. I went down to the very roots of the mountains, into the land whose gates locked shut forever. But you, O oh Lord my God, brought me back from the depths alive. Now, when you talk about the gates that locked shut forever, what are we talking about? Death. Death, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, when I felt my life slipping away, then, O oh Lord, I prayed to you, and in your holy temple you heard me. Those who worship worthless idols have abandoned their loyalty to you. But I will sing praises to you. I will offer you a sacrifice and do what I have promised. Salvation comes from the Lord. And that comes from the Good News Bible. We should recognize that to the ancient Israelites, the temple was considered to be the house of God. When appealing to the temple, one was, in effect, appealing to God. Exodus fifteen seventeen and 25, 8 and 9. When the fish spit Jonah out onto the dry land, do you think there was any evidence on the person of Jonah that he had been in that position for three days? Probably changed his skin color. Maybe. The digestive juices there somewhere. Did his skin show any changes? If so, might those changes in Jonah's skin have been helped have helped to validate, validate his story? In any case, Jonah decided it was time to obey God's call. Hmm, I wonder why he decided that. 
So now we've talked about the evil kings of Nineveh. What do we know about Nineveh itself? A prominent Assyrian city in the east bank of Tigris River, about 280 miles north of Babylon, founded by Nimrod, along with Rehoboth, uh, Iyer, Ir, or Kala, and Rosen, Rosen, Rosen. Genesis 10, 11, and 2, 12, forming a massive urban, urban quadrangle 60 miles across. Yeah. Wow. Rival Babylon for beauty and splendor with its royal palaces, temples, and broad streets, public gardens, and impressive library containing more than 26,000 clay tablets, one of the largest in the ancient world. Yeah, really. Defended by an outer wall, along with the inner wall, 100 feet high and 50 feet wide. You could drive chariots along the top of the wall. If, okay, uh, irrigated by Kaiser River, whose flow was controlled by a dam built by Senator of Seven and Seven. And Akron was the one who attacked uh, Jerusalem under Jerusalem. Hezekiah. 705 to 681 BC, and also by a large aqueduct that carried water from the second dam 30 miles away. Target of Prophecy. target of prophecies by Zephaniah, Zephaniah 2, 13 to 15, and Nahum, Nahum 1, chapter 1, verse 3. 1, verse 1, one and 3, verse 1. 3, verse 1 who warned of the city's ultimate destruction, destroyed in 612 BC by a siege by Babylonians, Scythians, Scythians. Scythians, and Medes, who penetrated its defenses when sudden floods eroded the walls. Well, those huge walls there were made out of mud, mud brick. Even though they're huge, when all of a sudden the river got out of control, it started wash washing things away, bang, the enemies got or in. Could it be the house Cyrus? Was it Cyrus who marched uh, into... Well, he, uh, he, his situation diverted. was a little different. He just diverted the river, and they marched under the, under the right. wall, the, yes. under the iron gates that were hanging down into the water. They, they, they thought that nobody would be able to go under that. Yeah. So, Right. But, uh, so that's what I was just thinking, that who yeah. knows if someone did divert, but... All right, quickly became uh, destroyed in 612 BC by siege by Babylonians and how do you spell that one? Scythians. I've read this already. Yeah. And uh, Mids, he, who penetrated the defenses when sudden flood eroded the walls, quickly became a mound of ruins that was ignored until just a century ago. Jonah chapter 1, verse 2. Yeah, so basically um, there was that incredible library there and everything, and it was just, it was just a bound of ruins, and nobody even bothered to look at it until about a century ago. Yeah. And then they started digging up and realized there was all these tablets so, and everything there. This is in Iraq. This Modern is in Iraq, Iraq, yes. Northern Iraq. Uh, the, Nimrod built this initially. Mm -hmm. So is this anything to do with the Tower of Babel or close by anywhere? The, I'm sorry, the which? Oh. The Tower of... Oh, yeah, not too far away probably. We don't know for sure where it was located, but yeah, somewhere in that area. Nineveh was a bigger city than Jonah had ever seen. When he arrived in Nineveh, he began to walk through the city just to get a feel for the task that he had been given. Did he show his passport at the massive yeah. walls? <laughs> yeah, probably. Jonah 3.3. 3. So Jonah obeyed the Lord and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to walk through it. Ooh, obeyed is an interesting term there. Yes. He finally succumbed to what the Lord did. I think at that point, 
<laughs> he would do anything. He might have turned over a new leaf. You know, he, he may have been sleeping down in the hull of that ship, but when they came, he kind of offered himself up. Go ahead, just throw me over. That'd be one less way that I can, or one other way I can get away from the Lord. Anyway, back to Jonah 3.3. 3. Assyria, a nation which had achieved a near legendary reputation for cruelty, was in a mild decline during these years, but it remained a threat. The repentance of Nineveh probably occurred in the reign of Ashurdan the third, that was 773 to 755 BC. Two plagues uh, in 765 and in 759 BC, and a solar eclipse in 763 BC may have prepared the people for Jonah's message of judgment. This is from Thomas um, Nelson's complete book of Bible maps and charts, Old and New Testaments. It's important, I want, in passing, I want to notice that solar eclipse. Yeah. It just so happens that a couple of people in ancient times, around about this time, decided to sit down and for a whole year, every time there was a lunar eclipse, every time there's a solar eclipse, they documented it exactly. And so uh, astronomers have been able to turn the clock back because it's all very regular to say exactly, they know, they know exactly what year this happened. They, that's very precise. Mm -hmm. And so many of those, most of the, what happened in the 7th and 8th centuries, ninth, some of the 9th centuries, they can, we can nail those, if, if, it's, if it's linked to the, the date of a certain king or something, we can nail it down sometimes to within a day or two of the actual ha time when it happened. It's amazing how... Just but a the, little quick sideline. So how about the death of Christ and the uh, skies getting dark? dark. Yeah, the, the, that was a completely miraculous thing that had nothing to do with any solar eclipse. Yeah, of course not. Yeah, uh, there was not, no... I mean, the, if you th look about it, the, that was happening at a Passover. When does Passover happen? Certain phases of the moon, which would be impossible to have a solar eclipse at the same time. Yeah. Impossible. And it was local, mm -hmm. more or less yeah. local. Yeah. Well, the royal inscriptions of Assyria afford the best commentary on the burning denunciation of the bloody city. In the wake of their conquest, mounds of heads, impaled bodies, enslaved citizens, and avaricious looters testified to the ruthlessness of the Assyrians. Little wonder that Judah joined in the general outburst of joy over the destruction of Nineveh. That's from our New American Bible, translated from the original language and so forth. That's a confraternity translation. All the other minor prophets in the Bible are full of long messages that they were given by God. Jonah's message consisted of seven words. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Jonah 3, 4. The rest of the book is all about his story. And what response did Jonah get when he began to preach to, the, to Nineveh? Jonah 3, starting with verse 1 through 10 from the Good News Bible. Once again the Lord spoke to Jonah. He said, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to the people the message I have given you. So Jonah obeyed the Lord and went to Nineveh. So this is after he's been thrown overboard, after he's been swallowed by the whale, thrown up by the whale, and then he finally goes to Nineveh, right? Yes. So Jonah obeyed the Lord and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to walk through it. Jonah started through the city, and after walking a whole day, he proclaimed, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God's message, so they decided that everyone should fast, and all the people from the greatest to the least <laughs> put on sackcloth to show that they had repented. For a few years they did, anyway. Yeah. When the king of Nineveh heard about it, he got up from his throne, took off his robe, put on sackcloth, and sat down in ashes. He sent out a proclamation of the people of Nineveh. This is an order from the king and his officials. No one is to eat anything. All persons, cattle, and sheep are forbidden to eat or drink. All persons and animals must wear sackcloth. <laughs> How do you get that on the animals? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everyone must, play, must pray earnestly to God and must give up his wicked behavior and his evil actions. 
Don't we wish it was that easy? Yeah. That if the king said so, perhaps God will change his mind. Perhaps he will stop being angry and we will not die. God saw what they did. He saw that they had given up their wicked behavior, so he changed his mind and did not punish them as he said he would. Good News Bible. Okay, question. question. Yes. Who else was prophesying during this time that we... Um, exactly at, at Jonah's time, nobody that we know of. He was a little ahead of a lot of other prophets. Well, it just seems odd that all he had to say was in... You know, 40 days. Their, you know, I mean, they were in decline. Yeah. They weren't as powerful as they used to be, but they still were a very strong com country. So yeah, they yeah. were they were at their maximum, uh, approaching their maximum at that yeah. time. Mm -hmm. Really, well, I, thought, I thought it had said. Yeah, no. it says they were in, they were in temporary decline. Yeah, oh, yeah. That doesn't mean a whole lot of decline. But it makes you think that there must have been something else going on. That's why it mentions the solar eclipse and some of those other things. Yeah. Maybe those things. Yeah. They probably took those as being serious warnings from God somewhere. I have my thoughts. Yeah. Um, the Lord went through Samaria and met this lady at Jacob's well. And she became a great witness. And the effect was felt for uh, centuries. So was the man um, on Lake Genesareth when he came up and there was one man who was demon possessed. He wanted to follow the Lord. He said, nah, you go and uh, speak to your brothers. Mm -hmm. How do you know that such a great thing that happened to the sailors? The moment the guy hits the water, everything is calm. Yeah. They didn't have any internet, but I believe the word spread like crazy. Mm. And you are, they all knew that the God of the Hebrews mm -hmm. was powerful. He had power over the wind that they worshipped. So I believe that's why the king even says, I'm going to be on the, even the animals had to wear the sackcloth. Yeah. Why? Because they heard this story that was so lively, so full of life. Yep. So that's my theory. What an incredible response. Furthermore, did the people of Nineveh and the king really understand God's call and what he was asking of them? Apparently they took it very seriously. Remember that this was a nation that was accustomed to conquering entire nations. Why did they give such an incredible response to the preaching of a single foreign prophet? They all knew perfectly well he wasn't, he wasn't uh, from Nineveh. Why did Jonah think that God's mercy was supposed to be limited to the Hebrew nation? Do we ever have any ideas like that? Oh no, not, not us, right? We now turn to the crazy part of the story of Jonah. Unfortunately, the story does not end with the repentance of Nineveh in Jonah 3. Wouldn't it be nice if it ended there? So, Jonah 4, 1 through 11. Jonah was very unhappy about this, that they had repented and became angry. So he prayed, Lord, didn't I say before I left home that this is just what you would do? Now, this is important because it implies that God and Jonah had conversations going on in the past, right? They'd had encounters before. That's why N Jonah wasn't going to do this. Mm -hmm. That's why I did my best to run away to Spain. I knew that you are a loving and merciful God, always patient, always kind, and always ready to change your mind and not punish. That's a pretty good picture of God, I'd say. Now, Lord, let me die. I'm better off dead than alive. The Lord, an the Lord answered, What right have you to be angry? Jonah went out east of the city and sat down. He made a shelter for himself and sat in, the, in its shade, waiting to see what would happen to Nineveh. Th then the Lord God made a plant grow up over Jonah to give him some shade so that he would have, be more comfortable, be, so he'd be more comfortable. Jonah was extremely pleased with the plant, but at dawn the next day at God's command, a worm attacked the plant and it died. After the sun had risen, God sent a hot east wind, and Jonah was about to faint from the heat of the sun beating down on his head. So he wished he, had be he were dead. I am better off dead than alive, he said. But God said to him, what right have you to, the to be angry about the plant? 
John replied, I have every right to be angry, angry enough to die. The Lord said to him, this plant grew up in one night and disappeared the next. You didn't do anything uh, for it and you didn't make it grow, yet you feel sorry for it. How much more then should I have been pity, uh, should I have pity on Nineveh, that great city? After all, it has more than 120,000 ancient, uh, I'm sorry, innocent children in it, as well as many animals. So. Men and women aren't very innocent, but the children were. Yes. Right? Well, and yes. weren't those children being sacrificed? In some, Possibly. In some other countries, certainly. Yeah. Probably there too. What is the real message of the book of Jonah? Why was Jonah upset by God's kindness toward the Ninevites? Doesn't Jonah 4 imply that there had been previous conversations between Jonah and God? Can you imagine what was said during those conversations? Hmm. Seems like God was pretty patient. Yep. There seem to be several major messages in the book of Jonah. Jim, can you help us with that? God takes a very personal interest in all people of the, all nations. He is not just interested in his own people, unless you remember that, in reality, we are all his children. Somehow Jonah learned that God was incredibly gracious, loving and kind, but Joseph, excuse me, but Jonah seemed to hope that God's kindness did not extend to the Assyrians. Hmm. God is apparently prepared to do almost anything that will result in people learning the truth about him. Why would a missionary, after being converted by that incredible experience in the fish, and who finally went to Nineveh, be so upset because his mission was successful? I mean, you know, what's going on here? Before he left, what do you think Jonah said to his fellow citizens at Jerusalem about where he was going? I mean, do you think he walked around town and said, God has given me a call, I'm going to go to Nineveh, I'm going to preach against it, and it's going to be destroyed. Think he said that? He kept quiet about it. Yeah. Well, at least when he got back, he kept quiet about it, huh? Well, I think before, he kept quiet about it, too. I see. What did he hoped would be the case when he came back? I mean, imagine, he said, I single-handedly destroyed the city of Babylon. I'm sorry, Nineveh. He was acting like a two-year-old with a temper tantrum. Can we go to the world with a serious message about what is going to happen at the end of the world, and at the same time, tell them that God is infinitely gracious, patient, loving, and compassionate? Is there any way to prevent them from becoming confused? Perhaps the big story of, or question in this study is, why being so successful in Nineveh was Jonah essentially not successful back home in Jerusalem or Samaria? How about that question? Yeah. Did Jonah still have some growing to do? Yeah, I think so. Carrie? When Jonah learned of God's purpose to spare the city, that notwithstanding its wickedness had been led to repent in sackcloth and ashes, he should have been the first to rejoice because of God's amazing grace. But instead, he allowed his mind to dwell upon the possibility of his being regarded as a false prophet. Mm -hmm. Jealous of his reputation, he lost sight of the infinity greater value of the souls in that wretched city. The compassion shown by God toward the repentant Ninevites displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Was not this my saying, he inquired of the Lord, when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of evil. That's from Jonah 4, 1 from Ellen G. White, Prophets and Kings, page 271. Okay. <clears throat> Why do you think God chose at that point in time to send a reluctant prophet from Israel to the Ninevites? Couldn't he have chosen and trained a Ninevite to carry the message? And what do you think of God's patience with Jonah? 
pro as Jesus said later, a prophet is never received in his own country. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Shouldn't we be incredibly thankful that God does not reject us from the first, first time we sin against him? And I, I just, I know, think of in our day, what would we say if somebody arrived with a strong Russian accident, accent and began preaching here and claiming that his job was to convert America? It would not go well. It would not go well? You don't think so? It might. It's just about as bad as some other things that are going on. Wow. So there oh. were prejudices back then, too. Oh, really? <laughs> so here's Nineveh. Here's Jonah sitting outside Nineveh, waiting to see what would happen. Okay? Why did God waste his time having that conversation with Jonah? I mean, and even if he did it, I mean, it seems like this is a story I almost would be better off of if you just left it out of the Bible, right? Well, they were trying to teach the, even the children of Israel, the yes. descendants of uh, David and Solomon and those, trying to teach them a lesson. Mm -hmm. And what lesson is he trying to teach them? Well, just the, the latter part of that uh, statement there by... Uh, uh, in, in the book of Jonah, yeah, it, it's kind and compassionate and so forth, and they just yeah. couldn't understand that. Uh, and and the other very obvious point is, like I said, they often thought that okay, the one God is, look, is is assigned here, another God is assigned there, another God is assigned there. So if you really believe that that Nineveh is assigned to Asher, the god of war, you know, would you go there? You thought. That's, that's not our territory. Yahweh is telling uh, Jonah, I am not the kind of person Satan has accused me to be. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. In a nutshell. Well, back earlier, uh, we had about, the, about obey. But it, the problem is the people didn't listen. That's, mm -hmm. that's it. We say that he sinned against God. But really, they just weren't listening. Mm -hmm. God wants to teach, but if you don't listen, I mean, how, how much noise do you need to, to make? So, and, and it's important in our studying and looking at particularly that idea about obedience, that there are two parts, two parts to obedience. You first of all, you have to understand the command, understand the directions, and that's the listening part that you've been talking about. The second part is you need to go and do something about it. At least that, and that tends to be the part that we emphasize. But in the Bible, the emphasis is on listening. Do you listen? Do you understand? That's the important part. I mean, the, the thief on the cross will be saved, and how much is he able to do? Nothing after, after he made his decision for God. He's witnessed to thousands of people over the generations since then. Yeah, that's also true. His story has, anyway. In the New Testament, there's a very small book that has some parallels to the story of Jonah. What do you think of the book of Jude? Have you looked at it recently? The book of Jude is not very familiar to most Christians. I can tell you that a lot of Christian scholars think, well, ah, this is, it, it's probably, it looks like maybe part of it was borrowed from Peter and so forth and so forth like this, and that, yeah, that's probably not very reliable stuff and they basically just reject it. Sometimes we sing a song based on the last two verses, a very, very wonderful song, and that, that may be all they know about Jude. But despite the fact that he had to deal with a lot of very wicked people, God is very patient with those who are still listening to him. Him again, listening to him. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. Do you think Jonah cared about the salvation of the Ninevites? Did he think about the possibility that someone from Nineveh might be saved and end up living next door to him in heaven? What would he say to them in heaven? Good to see you, brother. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you listened. In any case, he probably would not have been happy about that thought. God called Jonah to go to Nineveh because despite their sins, he loved the Ninevites. He called Jonah because 
He loved Jonah as well. And what about us? Do we have any responsibilities to those around us? Maybe co-workers or neighbors? How much time do we spend trying to reach them with the truth about Jesus? Don't they too need the rest, the rest we can find in him? In the charge given him, Jonah had been entrusted with a heavy responsibility, yet he who had bidden him go was able to sustain his servant and grant him success. Had the prophet obeyed unquestionably, unquestioningly, he would have been spared many bitter experiences and would have been blessed abundantly. Yet, in the hour of Jonah's despair, the Lord did not despise, desert him. Through a series of trials and strange providences, the prophet's confidence in God and his infinite power to save was to be revealed. Revived. Revived. Brought uh, back in, to life, right? Yes. Thousands can be reached in the most simple and humble way. The most intellectual, those who are locked, looked, up, upon. looked upon the world's most gifted men and women are often refreshed by the simple words of one who loves God and who can speak of the love and, and naturally as the worldling speaks of the things uh, that interest him most deeply. Ellen White, Christ Lesson, page three, 232. Talking about simple ways in which uh, people do God's will, I know the story of a, a man who was almost completely blind. He could see just a little bit so he had with his cane, he could walk down the street and try to stay on the sidewalk. And he had an old, pretty much beat up copy of The Great Controversy. And he would go to people's houses, knock on the door, and say, I'm sorry, I'm blind, I can't read this book. Would you be willing to read me a chapter out of this book? And he was far, he won more people to the truth than the whole rest of the church combined. Would you read me a chapter out of this book? Well, he had what? an advantage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If one studies the scriptures very carefully, and also if one looks at the writings of Ellen White, he will discover that there are three main things that call, God calls on us to do. Bible study, prayer, and witnessing to others. How well are we doing at all three of these? Does God have just as much work to do to try to convince us to go and witness as he does trying to convince sinners to come back to him? What do you think Jonah actually said to his friends in Jerusalem when he got home? Did he try to enter quietly and pretend that he had not been gone? Mm -hmm. It seems clear that Jonah was more concerned about his own reputation than he was about the salvation of the people of Nineveh. Jonah needed the gospel just as much as the people of Nineveh did. Um, do we? Jonah came from the small city called Gath Hefer, not too far from Joppa on the coastline of Israel. He tried to flee to Tarshish, as we noted already. We cannot be certain, but it is possible that Tarshish is the city of Tarsus in southern Spain near Gibraltar in our day. That was a journey of about 2,200 miles to the west. Nineveh is located about 700 miles northeast of Joppa in a very different location direction. So these are, these are very significant different uh, distances that, that Jonah is trying to, to travel. As a conservative Christian, when you associate with scholars from other regions, other religions, or, other, or no religion at all, and you want to talk to to them about the Bible, do you wish the story of Jonah were not there? John D. Morris, a PhD, a scientist with the Institute for Creation Research, explained the possibility of, jo of Jonah being swallowed by a large fish this way. There are several species of whale and of sharks alive today with gullets large enough to swallow a man whole. Among extinct animals like the plesiosaurs, the same could be said, and perhaps this was a heretofore unknown fish of large size. The point is, the story is not 
impossible. However, most importantly, the Bible says that the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, Jonah 1.17. Clearly, this event was a miraculous and not a naturalistic phenomena. Thus, we don't have to give it an explanation limited by our modern experience or knowledge. Could a man survive in a fish belly? The Hebrew idiom, three days and three nights, has been clearly shown both from scripture and other sources to mean a period of time beginning in one day, ending on the day after the one following. It doesn't necessarily mean three full days and nights. Furthermore, there have been several reported cases of modern sailors or other individuals swallowed by such an animal, only to be recovered many hours later. Morris goes on to say that as Christians, we believe in the miraculous, so we accept the word of God as the story reads in the book of Jonah. But again, this story involves the miraculous. It may be that Jonah actually died and was resurrected by God. This is implied in his description of his, of his experience, especially Jonah 2.2. Of course, resurrection is impossible, but it clearly happened on several occasions in Scripture, uh, Old Testament and New Testament, requiring a miraculous input. To deny the possibility of miracles, especially those miracles specifically mentioned in Scripture, is to deny the existence of God, and thus this is not an option for Christians. John D. Morris, did Jonah really get swallowed by a male a whale, etc.? We do not know exactly what Jonah's condition was in the belly of the whale. Was he able to breathe? Some have even suggested that Jonah actually died and then was raised to life just uh, to life again just before the fish spit him out. Um, God could do that. In studying this story, it is important for us to remember something about the Old Testament and even New Testament uh, prophecies. And in prophecy, there is a category known as conditional prophecy. This concept is expressed well in Jonah 3.10. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it, from the New King James Version. The fulfillment of the prophecy was based on their response. When they repented, God relented. Uh, Jonah's preaching had been a success. But the reluctant prophet did not recognize it. He felt like a failure. But centuries later, Jesus cited Jonah as an example of faithfulness for his preaching to Nineveh. And we're running out of time. Here is an incredibly good news. God does not give, us, give it up on us easily. So I hope in our study here of Jonah, you have learned that God works in incredible ways, even swallowed fish. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father. We're looking forward someday to meeting Jonah. We hope that he's in heaven and hope that we're in heaven. We will be wonder, it'll be very interesting to see what additional details he can give us about this story. We do not know exactly what will be the final fate of those people who lived in Nineveh, but we ask, we pray that your will was exercised in their behalf and that many will be found in heaven. May that be the truth. May that be our, the case with us as well as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.